So we're going to begin this evening with a few questions from myself and then after about 20 minutes or so we're going to open it up to the audience for a question and answer session and then after that we'll have a reception outside. So welcome and thank you very much. You've spent the morning with us and we were very delighted. We had alumni and and uh, the BD School staff with us, so we really enjoyed that. And now I want to ask you some questions um, for all of us in the audience. So you created the Martin Family Initiative, a charitable foundation with the goal of supporting the education, health, and well-being of Indigenous youth and communities. Can you tell us about your programs and their objectives? Elder. <laughs> um, Ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, I, 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 there are so many old friends that I have seen here. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't believe this, you know, especially, we could almost make this a liberal rally. The, the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then, <laughs> the, if I might, I, there, I just, I wanna ask Carlana Lindman just to stand up. Carlana Lindman is our director of, of our foundation. Um, I met her 12 years ago. Uh, I asked the Ontario government if I could borrow somebody to look at something for me, the Ontario government said, yes, there's somebody we can lend. And just to demonstrate that no good deed should go unpunished, we then hired her away. <laughs> so I just want to, and basically she deserves most of the credit for what I'm about to take credit for. But as you know, Andrew, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, also, I would like to just, in, in, to talk about Andrew for one second. I have known Andrew Petter for a long time. Um, as most of you know, <laughs> all right, there is no more compassionate, generous, understanding group of people than finance ministers. Um, <laughs> we are known the world over for our ability to help out and, and, uh, and this kind of thing. And so uh, I met, first met Andrew P Petter at a uh, finance minister's meeting and uh, uh, we immediately hit it off he he basically the first thing he said to me was you know he said look what you're doing to the provinces is simply immoral <laughs> and and uh, I said why don't the provinces stop whining and we just got, became good friends from then on <laughs> and and uh, and, and, and it has never, it, it never stopped. I have huge respect for him. I think his failure to understand the difficulty of being a federal finance minister <laughs> with a bunch of greedy provinces is something, but in any event, we have, we've succeeded uh, in keeping that friendship alive. Um, now, to answer your question. Um, I don't think I have to describe to anybody in this audience. Um, the situation in which we uh, put uh, the indigenous people of this country from the European contact, and I, I, I don't think any of you need any reminding. You know the numbers, you know the figures, and you know the tragedies that have occurred. Um, when I stepped down from government, I had, as, as you mentioned, started my, my role as prime minister with the Kelowna Accord, I would, and then as you know, I stepped down from government, which is a euphemism for having lost the election. The, um, <laughs> I um, really came to the conclusion that if there was any issue that I was going to spend the rest of my time on, and if you go into public life with a conviction there's something that you want to do, then it's not, it shouldn't be unusual that when you came out of public life, that's what you would continue to do. Um, and so we set up uh, what, what is now called MFI, um, and the programs, I'll name, I, we've got a number of programs, but I will name three of them just, I think, because of the application uh, to, the, to this audience. Um, the first one that we started was, in fact, uh, very much uh, close to the reason that, that I came. Uh, you know, what is an outstanding thing about this meeting and this audience is, in fact, uh, the, the, the indigenous uh, business program at the Beattie School of Business. Uh, it is the only one, that, to the best of my knowledge, that I know of in North America. Um, and the opportunity to be here uh, with Joy, to be here with Andrew, and to be there with a number of the people who are, 
who are, who are sitting here. We had a, a very good meeting this morning in which we really talked about um, in, in indigenous business, how in fact it should be, uh, how it should be promoted, the whole education field. And uh, I must say I learned a great deal, Joy, from, from, our, from our discussion. But the, it's within that context that our first program, 12, 10 years ago, when Carlana and I started, was a recognition that if one was going to deal uh, with the terrible numbers that, we, that exist within uh, uh, what the position that we have put Indigenous Canada in, it had to begin with education. And one of the areas it should start with is business education. Because if in fact we're going to turn this around, there has to be the opportunities uh, for people uh, to in fact succeed in the same way that other, co other communities succeed. And so we decided that we would, but the problem was that we would have to introduce it. That there were no, if you take a look, there are business courses taught in high schools across this country. Mm -hmm. There is no high school on or off reserve that taught business. And so what we decided to do was to set up a grade, a grade 11 and grade 12 business course. And um, essentially uh, teaching everything from marketing to accounting to all of those things which are taught in business courses. And we started at a high, school, a high school in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is a high school serving the fly-in reserves who live on the shores of Hudson's Bay. Um, and it was successful. And then we went to Winnipeg um, and into another school, and it was successful, but it was there uh, that, you know, we think we know it all, uh, don't we, Andrew, um, one of our finance ministers? The, um, the, the, what happened was in, in Winnipeg, a young boy came up to me, a young Cree, and he said, Mr. Martin, I really like this course. Um, and, he, and he said, uh, but I have one problem. And I said, what's your problem? He said, how come all the examples you teach in this course are from Montreal, Toronto, or Vancouver? Because he said, you know, he said, I live, come from a small community in northern Manitoba. And I've never been to any one of those cities. And he, he then went on to say, and how come every one of your role model, more role models is, is, uh, is he's the president of some big corporation, but guess what, Mr. Martin, we don't have any big corporations in my small community up in Northern. So I'll tell you something, every so often in your life, you suddenly begin to realize just how dumb you are. And that's when I, that, when I had that revelation. Um, I admit it today, I didn't admit it when I met Andrew. The, um, <laughs> the, but, so what we did, Carla and I, we basic, we, we, we essentially got two of our teachers, they went aside, and they took, they created the first workbooks and first textbooks ever done for a high school course teaching business. Um, and it's been a, they, and as a result of that, it's just taken off like that. We're now in some 46 high schools across the country. But what's really happening now, and this is what's so exciting about all of this, is that somebody like ourselves can have this idea. But when you go into the communities and you start reading, meeting the First Nations and they're looking at it, they begin to say, this is what you should be doing. And so we've got this course, it's a, high, it's a great success. But about a year ago, um, a number of chiefs came to Carlana and said, listen, this is fine. But what we need, we've got a lot of our people who drop out of school prematurely and we want them to go back and we want you to encourage them to go back and can you design a non-credit course that they will take either to start up their own businesses because they, they're not going to go back to school to try to get the credits or they want to go back to school and get the credits, that's their decision. And we're in the process of doing that and we've now got a new set of books and we're now going into Canano College in Northern Alberta has asked us, they're going to take, take this, this non-credit course, they're going to go into, uh, uh, into, small, into smaller communities. And the po only reason that I raise this is that this business course, which is really almost a forerunner, we ho I hope like heck the guys, who, the people, the guys and the girls who are graduating from this business course will go uh, to, to, to the Beatty School and, and uh, with, with joy. And that's what we would really hope. And that's, there's no reason why that can't be done. And so that's one, the one, pro, one program. Second program we started was, if you can't read or write, 
by the time you're in grade three, the chances are you're not gonna graduate from high school because they simply pass you on. And then eventually you, you, uh, you drop out. And the province of Ontario, uh, about 40 years ago, had a very bad literacy record. And what they did is they brought in, spent a lot of money and a lot of expertise to turn around the literacy uh, record in the 100 worst schools, none of which were Aboriginal, by the way, were First Nations, by the way. And so I went to the then premier, uh, or the then education minister, sorry, uh, of the province, and I said, we want the course. Um, and if we can have it, and we, would, and we hired the people who essentially introduced it uh, into, into, into Ontario. Uh, one was a, an educator, the other one was a former dean of, the, of uh, OISE, the Faculty of Education at the University of Toronto. And we introduced the course into, a, um, into two reserve schools to, to adapt it to the, to the First Nations. Um, and we are now in the process of, we're, we, we're now in a process of, of taking that course into 12 more high schools uh, across, across the country. Um, and in fact, one of those schools is in, uh, one of the new schools that we're, we're going to start off in September is a school that is in British Columbia. I'm not allowed to name it mm -hmm. because it's going to be announced. But this course, I think, is really what it is. It's a school improvement course. It teaches literacy in a way. And I'll just tell you, to, give you, to tell you what the results were, I'll tell you, just tell you a story. We go into these two unreserved schools in southwestern Ontario with a course that essentially says, look, you really got to rearrange the way in which you teach literacy kindergarten to grade three. Um, and it's a four-year course, basically teacher training. And um, to tell you how, much, how well this course did, the Ontario standard is here. 70% of Ontarians have achieved this standard. At the time we went into this school, um, the school, I think, had 15% of this, this particular school had achieved, could, could do, achieve the Ontario standard, which it was the average for First Nations on reserve schools in Ontario at that time. Four and a half years later, 81% wow. of the kids That's in our school could read it right at the Ontario standard. 81%, they beat the Ontario average. That's fabulous. But what really happened, which really just hit me right here, was when the chief of one of the two reserves, Kettle and Stony Point, stood up in front of an audience such as this to announce those results. This was a big man, tough, great guy. He stood up in front of them, and the tears pouring down his, fa down his face. He looked out, and he said, you don't think that we can do it, but let us have the tools, and our kids, will do better than anybody else's mm -hmm. across the country. And that, I tell you, when you get involved in something and every so often it just comes and hits you like a rock how worth, worthwhile it was. That was one of the great days of my life. Wow. You know, and so, and then the third course that I would just describe to you that, that we're involved in is one that is brand new. We have always started with with pilot projects, and we've done it in a community. In other words, we're, we're not really doing, we, we've done it in a community because that's where the power lies, that's where those were the decisions could be made. And we do as a pilot project because we're plowing new ground in every case. That's the whole purpose of what we try to do. And we do it in a partnership with the community, and the community is the senior partner, not us. We go in and we'll help, but they are the final authority. And the, the, the next story that I'm about to tell you, I think demonstrates the degree to which the community is the boss and not us. I don't have to tell anybody here um, the results in terms of, you know, 4% um, of the population produces over 50% of the children in foster care. Yeah. And in some of the Western provinces, the numbers are even worse than that. There's a very, well-known activist, indigenous activist, who said that one of the real problems that the First Nations have is that so many of the adults spend most of their life compensating for a tough childhood. And so the question is, how do you deal with that issue? What do you, how do you handle it? And so 
we decided to, to put together a program somewhat resembling one that is available in a couple of communities in the United States um, and in, has been tried once in Canada. And what it really is is a home visitor program. So what you get is you get um, a young mother uh, or a young mother-to-be, a young, young girl who is pregnant, um, who otherwise would have nobody to advise her because if effectively there's either been a family problem of any one of a multitude of kinds that you, you, you would want. And so how is, she gonna, how is she gonna do it? And so what we have done is create this program in which um, home visitors will go knock on the door and say, look, I understand that you're pregnant and I really wanna help you. Uh, now you, so then, and, and you then have to ask yourself, okay, now who are these people gonna be that are gonna go knock on the door? You can call them early childhood workers, you can call them mother's coaches, you can call them home visitors. But essentially what we have done is we've gone into a, co uh, to a community in Alberta uh, because this is our pilot project. And the way it, we, we've gone in and we have hired a supervisor in the community um, who had spent 20 years in the community as a nurse. And she's the one who's going to run it. And then a young woman in my office, by the name of Chloe Ferguson, who has spent a, a fair, an awful lot of time on this, um, we have posted a job and we have hired right now three and we're on our way to hiring 10 home visitors. And th what these are, are mothers in their 30s, their 40s, or their 50s. Women who have no training except that they have raised families successfully. Uh, and that, 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 that's what it is. And we went, we spent the last year and a half working with experts, social workers, uh, um, obstetricians, every kind of expert that you can f think of, indigenous first, non-indigenous second. And they have essentially put together a training program for these visitors. And, um, and then we, we worked with Centennial College in Winnipeg, that some, some of you may know, to basically make sure that we had the whole thing put together and we created a program, a set of cards, videos, everything to teach these home visitors how they should become the coaches for these young mothers. And then we set up, uh, and, and at the same time, we are going to, we have already had one, uh, and we're, we're going to have a succession once or twice a week, we're going to have speaking circles where the, the mothers, the pregnant mothers, and, and, and new, uh, uh, new mothers will sit around in a, in a working circle the same way as probably most of the women in here have done through their lives with their children. And they will basically have these sewing, sewing circles and, we'll, and the visitors will stay with the mother till the child is two years old. They'll say start with for the day, first day of pregnancy, hopefully, right through to two, to two days, uh, to two years old. And then what we're doing is we're setting up a play school at the end of the, the, the second year, a play school, and then we'll have a pre-kindergarten school. And that is all going to be that, that is all going to, going to be set up. But the point of this story is, is something else. Mm -hmm. Another wonderful thing that happens as you go along. Because don't forget, we're learning as we do this. A month ago, we started, uh, uh, we completed a week's training so we had this huge program set by these experts, and we had the three women who we've hired as home visitors, and we're gonna go on to hire the others. The three women, uh, then the supervisor, and we brought in some experts, and they worked for four to five days with these, uh, the, these home visitors-to-be, teaching them how do you do it? What do you, how do you handle the, the, the new young mother? What, what is it you deal with? And it was a tremendously successful thing. On the fifth day, they said, uh, our person and, and the, the, the supervisor who, uh, and the trainer said to these home mothers, now we've taken you through our course, now it's your turn to tell us what you think of what, what you've been taught. And it was like, it, we just, you lit a match. Those three mothers got 
totally excited. And they said, we, we've got an enormous amount we want to see. Because you don't know about our culture. We had our, it was set, was set by indigenous people, but they're not, they're not, they were not Cree from this particular community. And you don't know, you know, and so you don't know what, what, what it's like to be Cree, and you don't know what it's like to be a Cree from this particular community. And the mothers took apart what we had laid out to them. They didn't disagree with it. They just took it apart and said, this is the way you're gonna do it in our community. Not that way. And it was the most wonderful thing. I was not there, but it was described to me. As these mothers spent two and a half days rebuilding the program so that it would be a program that was available to the mothers in the community. And, it, and, and they did it. But what also happened was those mothers, those home visitors, they left after that first day and they started to talk to their neighbors. And so all of a sudden, the neighboring women started to come saying, we want to learn about this. We want to give you advice. And the thing took off. <laughs> Almost as if we can say within this community, they've, and they, one of them said, finally said it at the, at the end. He, she said, we're going to make this community there where there's not a child that ever has to go in go, in, go in, into foster homes. The, our kids are going to stay home, and they're going to stay home because we've now developed the means by which they can. And I tell you, it just it changed the whole nature of the course. And that's what this is really all about. And so I'll, I'll end it there. What it really is all about is that for us to be a very small cog in a very great deal of change. Those mothers took that over. And if we can succeed in doing that elsewhere, I can swear that for 10, 15 years from now, we will not have all, a majority of the children in Manitoba, the majority of the children in Saskatchewan in foster homes. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Manitoba, and I know what you speak of. And I'm a former deputy minister, so I know that Things need to change from other places, and it's admirable to listen to you and to uh, hear about the space that you're creating and the listening that you're doing with community. And that's wonderful, and I'm going to watch as well in, your, in the community to see what happens and support it if we can. We have, we have students in our uh, MBA program from all over Alberta as well. Uh, I want to pick up on a couple of things that you said particularly about that young Cree man from, from Winnipeg. And I'm not going to just focus on Manitoba and Winnipeg because I'm from there. But um, you talked to, he talked about content and how folks were in the stories that you were sharing and the learning was from uh, a different place than from where he's from. That's something that um, is also part of what we're trying to change with our MBA program with respect to research and case studies and getting more Indigenous content because there isn't a lot. There's hardly any across Canada around Indigenous business and, and case studies. But also, um, we also are experiencing something else, and I'm going to ask you uh, about this, is um, what can institutions, post-secondary institutions do to support, for example, Indigenous students in their um, quest uh, to come to school when we've noticed, running our program, that one of their biggest barriers is access to funding. Um, we would, I would say anecdotally, we're doing a case study on our, on, on, on our alumni, but about half get, federal, get funding from the band and the other half don't. We have um, a student who has a GoFundMe page. We have scholarships, as much scholarships as we can, but they're not enough to support as well. So what can institutions but also government do to support um, changing and allowing space for Indigenous students to, to go to post-secondary school? Well, the first thing I think is I, I, was tr I had a meeting, I had a meeting uh, uh, with, with Joy and with a number of the people who are here from, from the BD School this morning. Carolina and I did talking um, about, about, about business, talking about business schooling, telling me how, how, do you, how, 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 should, it, how should it work. Um, the, and I, I've got to tell you, I was tremendously impressed. I, uh, tremendously impressed. Um, there's no doubt that, that we have a problem in Canada. This is not simply a problem um, with, uh, with indigenous, indigenous kids, but you know, you, there, there is a problem when, I mean, when, when I went to university, 
which was not yesterday. But uh, when I went to university, you know, a lot of people graduated from university with student debt, but nowhere near the amount of student debt that you hear them graduating with today. Um, and uh, that, that, that there is, this is a fundamental problem. If you take a look at the Canadian economy, take a look at the global economy, we are going through a change. We all understand that what the digital economy is going to do. I mean, the changes to the economy are absolutely staggering. And for us to continue on the same basis as we have been operating for the last 20 or 30 years with this kind of economic change, well, we are not going to be competitive because if kids can't afford the best education possible, and if kids cannot afford to develop into the digital economy, let me tell you, other countries are going to do it, and, uh, and there is going to, and it, well, I, I don't think I have to describe to you what is going on. So, number one, um, I do believe that what the, what the government ought to do is, uh, is essentially say, well, first of all, I think there's got to be greater help. And it, they showed it, if, if you may know that the province of Ontario substantially increased the capacity uh, for kids to go to university. They basically have subsidies for, for their tuition. Um, Ontario has done a lot of very good things with, in, within this area. The increase in First Nations kids going applying to go to university as a result of these, of these improvements has been staggering. I think it was something over in the base two years, don't hold me to the numbers, but, um, but I think it was something like 36%. And that's a staggering increase in a very short period of time. And so there is no doubt that if what in fact government can do is to, I, and one of the things that I would suggest is, is that, is that you, you'll get more money out of corporations if they're matching government money. Uh, it's just, a, it's a human, human uh, uh, thing. So basically what I think government should say is get the money from the corporation, we, w we will match it. Now, let me just say to you that there will be the argument that governments can't afford to do it. Well now I suspect that the former finance minister from British Columbia would agree with me. You know, th th I spent an awful lot of my time fighting deficits. The pro deficits which are caused by debt service are bad deficits. Deficits which come from investment in the future are not bad spending. There is no higher return, I can tell you this, and I suspect you would agree with me, Andrew, there is no higher return from a government investment than the money spent on education. And the reason for it is that and here's the problem, we've got to stop saying that it's today's deficit. We've got to be worried about t the, tomorrow's deficit. Well, the way you reduce tomorrow's deficit is you get people take, getting an education, getting a job. And the, de the deficit fight against a today's deficit is just simply my generation saying to my kids, too bad because I'm going to push this off to you. That's what Donald Trump, what Donald Trump has done in the United States is exactly that. He has saddled the next generation with a massive, with a massive indebtedness. And so the answer to your question is to say, listen, invest in the things, invest in the things that is going to reduce my deficit in five years to a decade. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that anything that will encourage kids to go to school, anything that would encourage kids, to, indigenous kids to go work, to go to school with you, Joy, I tell you, is the kind of thing that's going to give us the, the next economy. Listen, we keep saying that the, the future is up to the children. You want to know where the future of this country lies right now? It's like to me, old people like, like Andrew and me. The, the, uh, but the, we're the majority in this country. We're not going to buy any refrigerators. We're not going to make any refrigerators. The, the fact of the matter is, if you want the, the next generation the fastest, growing, the fastest growing population in our country, in this country, is abri our Aboriginal people, Aboriginal students. For the first time in the history of the country, there are more people over the age of 65 than have ever been in our, in our history. And the majority of, and, the, and the, there are less kids under the age of 15 than ever before. But the fastest growing segment of those people are young indigenous people. For God's sake, give them the money to go to school because the future of the country depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. I agree.
we've been fortunate enough to have some good investment in our scholarship and so we're hoping to, to grow that as well. But having you here and to talk about that is, is going to help us a lot. So Jimmy Gwich, thank you very much for that. I have another question and it's more about um, something we talked about earlier this morning around informing 85% of the population that just isn't aware of the, of, of, of the situation of reconciliation and so on. And, and to inspire leaders, how do we do that, inspire leaders like yourself to, who, is, who become informed and then become champions and allies for us? I think that's something we still need to do. There's a, an organization called Indigenous Works uh, run by a fellow called Kelly Lindsay. Um, and uh, the, the numbers that Joy has just given have come from a study that they did. 85% um, of Canadian business essentially said that they had nothing to do with the Indigenous issue. They, it was not a concern of theirs, and it, it, was, it, it did not involve their, the way they looked at the world. Now, that's a study that was done came out about a month and a half ago. And there is no doubt in this country, the most knowledgeable people in the business world uh, in terms of the future of Indigenous Canada are the people who are in the extractive industries for the very reasons that are pretty, pretty clear to you. I mean, if you're a mining company or an oil and gas company, of course you're gonna understand it. But if you, you take a look at the staffing in, some, in, in most of these companies, there's a great deal more knowledge there than there is elsewhere. But if you're running a, a manufacturing company uh, uh, somewhere in the country, um, the, uh, and nobody's coming, nobody's challenging you, nobody's doing anything, you basically continue on with the same lack of awareness that you were born with. And, and, and so that is the issue that we've really got to face up to. The fact is that the business community, the other 85%, when you talk to, when you talk to the business community about the issue, you'll find great under sympathy. There, they, there, nobody wants to turn their back on it. I find my experience with the business community generally is a business community that, that, that wants to be involved, that understands it's important when it's explained to them. But if it's not explained to them, it simply doesn't exist. You don't try to work on problems that you don't know exist. And so I think that there is a huge responsibility in all of us in fact, to make sure that, that, that this goes beyond the headlines and that the business, business community is given the opportunity to know what's going on, which is what you're doing. Right, and it'll also help us in terms of one of the other challenges and, and for particularly our graduates of the MBA program and getting involved in the corporate side in terms of board of director positions and so forth. That's another area that I know that is very, is dear to my heart. I went through the, the director's education program and I think that that's an area that we need to still enter into. There's, there's no space there for us yet. Well, let, let, me give you another, let me give you another answer. A fellow called Don Drummond, who was in the Department of Finance when I was there, and he's one of the outstanding public servants, did a study about two months ago. Um, and essentially, given this, you, you know, the, the, the fact that there are more people over the age of 65 than ever before in our history, um, and that there, then there are more people over the age of 65 than they're under the age of 15, he basically, he basically did the projections. So, 4% of the population, that's the indigenous population in the country, but given that all of the young people, the, uh, are the fastest growing section of all those young people under the age of 15, which is a very small group, mm -hmm. um, are Aboriginal, basically projected that 20 years from now, 20% of the labor growth in this country is going to be indigenous. Now you think about that, 20% of, of the labor growth, that's doctors, lawyers, scientists, electricians, whatever you want, is going to be indigenous. And we undereducate them? I mean, the, that, that, it, it just is it's arithmetic nonsense. And so for our basic thing has got to be to say, if I came to you and said, 20% of the labor growth in this country is not going to have a high school education. What do you think? You'd say, for God's sake, we have to do whatever the heck we can make it, and then we've got to get them into the BD school so they can learn about <laughs> business. But that's what you have to do. And we're not doing it. But I think when you give people those kinds of numbers, 
and then you project it ahead, it becomes a straight economic decision. It's a moral decision, obviously, but it becomes a straight economic decision, and that's what has to be done. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna end up with one last question, and then I'm going to be then opening up to the audience for, um, for your chance to ask Mr. Martin uh, any specific questions you have. So this is my cue to ask you the last question. And I wanna know, um, well, I guess there's lots of people in here that would like to know, what do you see as reconciliation in terms of today, how you think it should shape tomorrow, the future, um, and what benefits will bring to Canadians? And I know you've been touching on it in terms of our demographics and the young, the young people in our community. But if we do it right, if we do reconciliation right today. I think it's, uh, I think it's trust to begin with. Um, I think it's, I think it's respect, and I think it's partnership. It, 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 it's sort of the themes that I've been throwing. On the trust, the trust side, um, it's there. There's a there is a, a lack of trust on both sides. The the lack of the, the lack of trust uh, com that which comes from the non-indigenous side. Are well? Are, are they going to produce um, the uh, the existing thing? My gosh! If we give them more money for education, are they going to spend it on education? Well, I'll tell you something. You know, you go into a, you go into one of these communities, and you, if you're a, if you're the chief of that community, and you've got insufficient money for health care, and you've got money insufficient money for education, you've got insufficient money for clean water then you're not going to spend it on, on, on as much education as you should. But there's a reason for that. Um, but on the other side, we've also got to admit that there is a lack of trust from, from the, the First Nations yes. uh, towards the non-First the non, the non Nations. And if you looked at the history, I wouldn't trust either. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what, what the first thing that has to, be, has to happen, and I think it is getting better, by the way, I think there is trust more and more on both sides. Um, the second thing is partnership. Um, I talked about some of our programs. I'll tell you what happened in that community uh, in, in Alberta when, when those women took over this program. Um, well, <laughs> that's, partner, that, that is a part, that's a real partnership. They're the bosses. They are the final authority. This isn't us doing that something for them. We're going to be gone in five years. That's the basic deal, mm -hmm. and and it is. It's a genuine. It's a genuine partnership. And then respect. Is there's no one in this room who wouldn't walk out if they thought they were not being respected? Mm -hmm. But we we have to admit the lack of respect that has existed. And, and we've, got, we've, we've really got to face up to it. And for me, um, that's what reconciliation is all about. And I think, we've made, I think we have made great strides. I, I don't think that we should be wailing here. I think we have made great strides, but we've got a long way to go and we can't rest on our laurels now. Right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for that. I wanna just finish off what you were talking about with to acknowledge uh, Simon Fraser University and the Beattie School in terms of what we talked a little bit about this morning, which I'm extremely proud of, is that um, within just eight months, we started the, the actual Indigenous business programs based on the inaugural, uh, the inaugural MBA program in Indigenous Business and Leadership. And today we have four Indigenous women in that business program running it. So when you talk about the Indigenous women taking in charge, that's what we've done at IBL. And thank you to the Dean and the Associate Dean and to the President for having the um, wherewithal and creating the space to allow us to do that. And to have us here today, that's what, that's, this is part of that success is being here. So, Jimmy Gwetch to all you. And I'm going to now open it up. Could, could I, mean, oh, I just want, I want to pick up on, on, on that though. Look, at, I spent, before I went into, in, into, into government, I spent most of my life in business. I know a little bit. And um, I, I gotta tell you that the discussion that we had this morning, 
I did not know very much about the BD School, to be quite honest, before I came. I, could not, I can tell you right now the discussion that we had this morning in terms of what, what is required in a business school, um, where is it going to go, was as good as anything I have ever seen. And so I really think that you clapped a little bit of times. I would really like it if you clapped like heck. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, so we have two folks in the back that are going to um, carrying around a mic, and if you want to, oh, we have a question right up here already. Uh, good stuff. Uh, Mr. Martin, thank you for your uh, remarks. Um, uh, my name is Paul as well, and I work in the field of child welfare in Vancouver, mm -hmm. including Indigenous child welfare. And one of the barriers I see for children in the school system in the city of Vancouver, and with Vancouver being one of the most expensive cities in the world, uh, is the, uh, the issue, the cost of living issues, such as uh, child care, uh, adequacy of income, and also housing. And uh, so I'm wondering what your view is of the role of the federal government and the provincial governments in creating housing and child care and uh, ensuring adequacy of income uh, for children who are living in poverty, and also particularly the issue of supportive housing or housing geared for uh, indigenous families. Well, I, I actually met today with, with the head of the, the uh, Aboriginal Housing Authority, and um, I must say that she made a very powerful case on for the Aboriginal Housing Authority and in fact how it should play within British Columbia. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that, that, I mean, Aboriginal housing cannot take second place to other housing. Well, there's a housing problem. Uh, but the last I looked, I, there were not very many Indigenous people trying to buy those massive condos. Um, you know, we, we, we understand how the problem can be solved. I think that I think that the, when the federal government got out of the business, they walked away. And you can't believe how when a government doesn't understand an issue, uh, how difficult it is to deal with. And, and this woman, the head of it, I, I won't identify her, but I, I think she's probably still here. She just waved at me. She actually, I don't know if that was a wave or a fist, but the, uh, but uh, I, I think that it's, it's I'll tell you what happens. So many decisions are made by ministers of finance in a government. Ottawa does not have a Department of Housing. Ottawa does not have a Department of Education. There is no direct pressure put on a minister when you don't have it. The Minister of Defense will come in and complain like heck about not getting the money. Those others don't. And so I think that what's pretty clear, the point that has to be made, is that in things like housing, where the federal government is dealing with it, these bodies have got to be much strong, probably have got to be given as much authority as they possibly can. That's the best answer that I can come up with. Okay. Oh, that's Brent. He's an alumni of our EMBA IBL program. So I didn't even see you there. Okay, I can see you now. Okay. Hello. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you, Joy Kramer, Right Honorable Paul Martin. BD School of Business. My name is Brent Ramsey. I am, as Joy said, I'm a graduate of the IBL program and presently a doctoral student. My question is about Indigenous small business. Uh, what do you see uh, as the future importance and development of Indigenous small business ventures? Thank you. The single biggest problem that you're going to hear out there, uh, uh, but there, there is more than one, is the, is the question of financing. It is not as, um, it's not as easy uh, for a, it's, it's not easy for any small business person to raise the funding that they want, but it's harder for an indigenous person uh, to raise it. Um, in many ways, because some of the, some of the, the, the some of the abilities of the ways in which to handle financial institutions are not, av not available to them. 
one of the one of the things that I think is so important uh, is really about your school is that this will be taught. But I must say that in addition to what is being done at BDN, I would almost make this suggestion: somebody um, along the lines of the course that, that Carlana Lindemann is now doing within the within the communities. How do you prepare a proposal if you've never been in business and you're going to go raise money? Who the how, just preparing the proposal to get the money requires an enormous amount of a, a, enormous amount of work and enormous amount of skill, and that that is not normally available. And we really hope that what we're in the process of doing with this program will provide that. Um, the the second thing is that, and and I'm, some people here and some of the communities will get very very upset, um, but small business run by an individual in my opinion, has a much better chance of success than small business run by a government, whether that government be a big government or whether it be a community. And I think that what has to really happen is the encouragement of entrepreneurship within a number of the communities is something that's got to be worked on. Um, and it's why I think that either Carlana's course or obviously if they have a chance to go to BD, then you're going to get that kind of thing. But I, re I also believe, by the way, that it won't take long. If the understanding is there that the pe people have got to be trained for the opportunity, there is no, in, in, if you take a look across this country, the successful communities who are near major centers um, really do very, very well. And, and, and what, that's where I think initial focus has to be. But we've also then got to recognize there are a lot of communities up there that are not near other communities and they've got to, they're, going to require, they're going to require special incentives and special help. But for heaven's sakes, the history of this country has been built on governments providing incentives to people to invest in, 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 in areas such as that. This is not, this, this is not new stuff. So if you take a look at the way many of the smaller parts of Canada the, uh, have been built, they've been built because governments have incentivized people to go there. That's one alternative. And then the other is, if you take a look at where the really successful businesses are, Darcy Bear in Saskatoon, Member 2, the, the, the Member 2 in, in, in Cape Breton, they are all, member, you know, the, the Satina in, in Calgary, near Calgary, they're all ma near these major cities and they've taken advantage of it. And all it is really required is for people to show that this can be done and then I think you'll see quite an increase in small business. Yes? Hi, um, I'm Eva Lewis. I work with the School of Public Policy here at SFU. Um, I've been thinking about reconciliation and, and education in the context of um, high school students. I have a, a son and a daughter who are in grade eight, and, or grade nine and grade 10. And they're learning much more in their curriculum in terms of indigenous uh, history, reconciliation. But I wondered your thoughts in terms of connections that uh, indigenous and non-indigenous high school students can make and role models um, from the indigenous communities that you know, could share knowledge and, and understanding for, for both of those groups in terms of future learning. Well, I mean, obviously it would be great, but. You know, one of the things that I'd like, it would be interesting if somebody in this audience could, could almost respond to, you're saying can indigenous kids and non-indigenous kids come together, which is what you're saying. Well, yes they can. Let me just tell you a story. Um, this business, the business program that Carlana runs, we took it, in, I told you that we took it into Winnipeg. And um, it, we, there's a school, those of you, any of you from Winnipeg here, Gordon Bell uh, mm -hmm. High School. And um, the, when we took it in, the, the course is really reserved for uh, uh, indigenous kids. So Gordon Bell's got a very large indigenous population at this school. So we took it into the school, and uh, then I was supposed to go there for the opening of the course. The course was done, it was opening, it was happening. And, uh, but a week before I went, I got a notice from the principal saying, don't come now. 
um, and I, she didn't give me a reason. So I talked to some people and they said, look, there are real tensions in the school. The school is, has got kids from all over the world, um, but there's tensions between the Aboriginal kids. There is actually tensions between various uh, ethnic groups, but the real tensions are between the non-Indigenous kids and the Indigenous kids, and this is not the time to come. So I was fine. About a year later, a year and a half later, I got a call saying, come, come. Uh, and so I, I went there and I, I basically said, how come I can come now and I couldn't come a year ago? She said, the tensions are gone. The, uh, the, the principal uh, essentially took steps to make sure that the, the, that the tension was gone. And so uh, I sort of thought about that, but they, nobody gave me an answer. So I went in, I went in and I guess I can walk with this thing, yeah. Um, I, I came up on the stage because I was supposed to speak to the, to the students. And as I walked by, there were a group of, of, of girls, First Nations girls, who were drumming. I'd never seen an all-girl drumming group before. And these, these, these girls were all drumming. And I, so I, I stood beside them and I watched them drum. And I asked them if I could join them and they said no. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and then while I was watching them, um, all of a sudden I heard what was a crash and I looked over there and there was um, an African drumming group. The, these were kids primarily from Ethiopia who were, who were emigrated there. And all of a sudden as it went on, despite the fact that I'm relatively tone deaf, I could tell that as the girls would go down, the African group would go up and then the African group would go down and the girl uh, would go down and, and the, the girls would go up and they were playing in sync and it was just s staggering. So I, when, I, when that was over, I was supposed to stand up and speak and they, the way it would work is they would ask questions and I would answer. So I basically said, um, I turned to the principal, I said, you've really solved the problem, haven't you? And she said, yes. So I said, I'm not going to answer your questions. I'm going to ask you questions. So the first person to ask me a question was a young lady from, from China. And I said, uh, how do you get along with all these people here? Uh, what about these people who claim that they've had this country before anybody came? And she said, but they had. They just, that's what she said. She looked at me basically, and you can see in her eyes, you idiot. They, they, <laughs> this was their country before, uh, uh, before any of us came for it, and they, and, then, then they, and they have welcomed us. So then after a while, a, a, a young First Nations kid came up, and I said, what's it like sharing your country? We said, this is wonderful. Don't you understand? They are building the country with us. And they basically lectured me, and it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever heard. So I was all over. I left, and this is a long way to get to the, the punchline, for, forgive me. So I asked, I said, how did you do this? And what, what she said is the following. She said, after we found this situation where the tension wasn't that you couldn't come, we decided we had to do something about it. So what I did was, along with the vice principal, when it came time for lunch, all the kids would pour out of the class, we would go up this one corridor and the kids would be coming down. And so there'd be three or four First Nations kids walking along, uh, walking along a, a, a group. We would grab the three of them and we'd shove them into an empty classroom. And then another two minutes would go along and there'd be some Ethiopian kids coming along and we would grab, grab two or three of them and we would shove them into the empty classroom. <laughs> and then there'd be a couple of, you know, Hungarian kids would come by and we would grab them and shove them in until we got about 20 into an empty classroom, nothing else. And we just locked the door and they said, we're not, you can't leave, we're go you can't leave uh, for an hour. I don't care what you do, you can sit there, uh, but you're not leaving for an hour. <laughs> And what the heck did those kids do? <laughs> they talked to each other. And then, so that was, that was fine. So then she said, then we did it the next day. And then we did it the next day. And she said, we started doing it so much that we could see the kids would deliberately then go come down in groups of two to three so that they could get picked out and go in there. <laughs> and they talked to each other. And she said, six months later, there was no tension. And it had all changed. And so when you go to it, maybe that's what's gotta happen. Because one of the problems that we have in, 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 in this country, 
and you can see this in those of you who are coming from small towns beside reserves. We go into the small town and we talk to them. The small pe people in the small town have never been on the reserve. And the people in the reserve barely don't know anybody in the town. And what I think we've really got to do is to start picking people out, putting them into an empty classroom, <laughs> and tell them to talk to each other. That's the best answer that I can give you to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, Miles Jolliffe. I'm in the uh, SFU Aboriginal Business and Leadership Program. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be in the next graduating class, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> I think my question, I think it falls in line with the theme of tonight's activities. It's very topical, well, maybe a little, little off, you know, the current topic of education, but it's uh, in regards to uh, the announcement this morning uh, regarding uh, by the, the current finance minister, uh, the purchase of the Trans Mountain Kinder Morgan pipeline. And I suppose my question is, how do you reconcile, you know, the advancement of reconciliation with, say, government commitments to meet UNDRIP and uh, what well, the current, uh, I guess, purchase of a pipeline, which necessarily doesn't have uh, all of the uh, First Nations on board with free and prior informed consent, and then just sort of thoughts on that, and then how do you actually, you know, proceed with that when you, you can't always get people uh, to agree? So I'm just interested on your thoughts there. Thank you. Um, well, look, there is, no, there is no debate about the absolute necessity of free and informed consent. Um, that, that if somebody was going to do something in my backyard, they better bloody well talk to me. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, and it, consent, in my opinion, does not only come down to consent of, of the band council, consent really comes from the community. So that there, there, is, there is no such, there is no debate there. Um, the, the second part of your question, however, is there is a there's a the clear difference of opinion between one group of First Nations and another group of First Nations. So this is not, from that point of view, this is not an Indigenous issue. This is an issue upon which reasonable people on both sides of an issue have disagreed. That's democracy. And, um, and that's what's happening here. Uh, and so, um, I mean, I think that, I think under those circumstances, um, as long as you, the, you ha, the, what, what has been done is the maximum in terms of the, the assessment process, uh, uh, which I think has been done. Um, and uh, I have also looked at the marine side because I know a little bit about it. I think that that has been done. Um, I think the government has taken a decision which is perfectly entitled to take. And it's, it, this is not an indigenous issue. Because of, the, because of the different positions. It is a position upon which Canadians can differ and the government's got to decide and it's made, it's made a decision. So, you know, and I can understand fully that not everybody in this room is going to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my laughing is really loud, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Andrew Bach, I'm a member of Tawasin and a graduate of the IBL program. Sorry, I'm... No, I find... There he is. You're a big guy, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hard, hard to miss. Um, my question is around, uh, around education, and when the subject comes up, uh, it's often assumed that education represents uh, learning from a Western perspective. And I'm wondering uh, if you could share your thoughts on, uh, in your time uh, uh, working with uh, Aboriginal communities, uh, if you could share some thoughts around uh, how some of the lessons that Indigenous uh, people can provide to Canada, how can we build some of those bridges? How can we uh, share with mainstream Canadians, how can we share with government and industry the, uh, the learning that uh, uh, Indigenous communities have and take the focus a little bit away from Western style knowing to, uh, to other ways of knowing and integrate those things uh, into reconciliation? Look, I think that's really, I think that that is an important, um, that's an important question for a number of reasons. The, the fact of the matter is, I don't want my kids not to understand um, 
indigenous culture. Um, I don't, I mean, I am Western educated. Um, obviously, this is the bulk of, of what uh, uh, of, of what I what I understand, but I am fully capable of understanding that there is a different perspective, uh, and it's one that that I that I should have, and that my that my, my 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 kids should have. Most of us, most of us who have been who have been Western culture, Western teaching, have essentially been taught that we are above nature, and that we can do whatever the heck we want to do with nature. The fact of the matter is that the indigenous culture essentially says we are at one with culture. And we've basically been able to reject that. But if you sit down and talk to a quantum physicist, a quantum physicist will tell you that in fact we are one with nature. And so um, the, I, I think that one of the really terrific things that is in the process of happening here is, and, and Andrew, you can talk to this because it started when you were at, at UVic, this whole concept that in terms of indigenous law is, is, I think, going to, is bringing this idea to a head. Because what you're talking about is what informs your decision making. Doesn't mean, and I've asked the question, and I'm not sure that the, I've asked the question about conflict of laws. I'm not sure that the answer is that, that this is not about conflict of laws. I think there will be conflict of laws in terms of land. But that's fine. That's the way it is. But essentially what I believe that is happening here, the whole question about indigenous culture is simply informing, informing decision making and informing our culture. And I think what you're going to find the way, just the way that it, it's happening with quantum physics, I think what you're going to find is a fundamental reconciliation between Western culture and indigenous culture. And it's not only going to happen here, but it's going to happen around the world. Because the indigenous culture, the land base that exists, for instance, does, does, in, does qualify indigenous culture in a way that ours does not. And I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think there's an absolute necessity to understand both. And I think that's in the process of happening. And I really do believe that, that the, one of the things that's gonna fundamentally change the lack of awareness is that. I mean, what really happened, you and I know as full, full well, when the European contact occurred here and they came, I mean, the, 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 European, the European, whether they were English, whether they were French or whether whatever they have, Spanish, they could not understand what the First Nations had to say. They could not understand the basic cultures that exist. And besides that, we all understand under, under what was the missionary heritage at that time, they weren't going to listen anyway. That's, not, that's now changing. And I think that when you think about it, that major universities in this country are in the process of developing legal, uh, essentially legal, uh, 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 legal avenues to, legal, to, the, to, to graduation that are cultural, indigenous culture based, that that's gonna have a fundamental shift in the, the argument that we've never heard before. And I think that that's gonna have a huge effect on our ability to look at things. Um, I don't know, but you know, you and I have talked about this, Andrew, and I, you can probably express it better than I can. But I've had this discussion now. I've had this, I've had this discussion with, with, obviously, with Maori. I've had this discussion with, with, uh, with Aborigines. Um, but interestingly enough, I've had a, I had a very interesting discussion um, with a Chinese uh, um, mathematician uh, in, which he, in which he said, although everybody thinks that the Han Chinese are a common ethnicity, we are not and that we have cultural differences between Han, Han speaker, there, there are, he said there are, there's something like 13 different Han dialects, and he said they represent very different perspectives on what the world is all about, and they handled it very well. And so I think, that there, I think what you will find is the same kind of thing will happen with us, and we'll have a heck of a lot to learn, you know. I hope you agree, because you're bigger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and just as a side note, we have John Burroughs, 
who's from That's the, right. yes, he comes and teaches in our, in our MBA program as well. Thanks to Andrew, you brought him over. So, thank you. Okay, we have another question right here. Well, I've actually talked to John, so have I agree you? with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. My name is Sharon. Uh, I'm a graduate from the School of Communication at SFU and more recently a graduate uh, from the University of Massachusetts with the Master's in Curriculum. My question relates to more to your organization and how you select the kinds of projects that you pursue. And after you select those, uh, it's clear from your examples that you take a different approach to course development or educational development. And I'm just wondering how you decide what your approach is going to be in each situation. Well, is your question how have we selected our projects? Uh, I guess my question is two parts. The first part is uh, how you do select which projects you're going to pursue. And once you've made that selection, how do you decide your uh, development approach to that each particular project? Um, I'm going to answer your question, all right? If the woman sitting over there attacks me, you will help me. Right? Um, the, because we, quite simply, we recognized a need. I didn't go into a lot of the, I didn't go into a, a number of the, of the projects, but I'll give you an example. Um, we had, I, I talked to you about the second course, which is, was based on literacy, and essentially that we, had, we came across this Ontario course, which they dealt with literacy, and literacy is fundamental. I mean, if you can't read and write, then you're not going to succeed anywhere. And so, and but what we found, as a, as an example, because everything follows from from everything, so we found it in the literacy course. All of a sudden, there were two things that happened. One of them was that um, the math scores of these kids started to go up, and all well, why? Well, they watched it because fine for the first time the kids could actually read the math questions, but it also then suddenly brought well. Wait a minute, if we're going to do this, what about STEM? So we're going to we're going into STEM. Now that was just simply one thing led led to another. Second second thing that happened in it, and and, I, and this happens unfortunately in a lot of schools, is that the kids who couldn't read were being treated as kids who had a, some kind of a deficiency, a disability. Well, they didn't. They just were never taught how to read. And what we found out was, when, once we started to teach, the, once these kids were taught how, how to read, all of a sudden the so-called disabilities that the teacher said, oh my God, this kid is unteachable, the disability disappeared. And so, and then, so that, what that then turned us, started us doing is saying, we've got to do better screening. So it, all of these things, you know, went from one, one thing to, 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 to the other. The, 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 the thing I told you about the early, the early childhood, where what happened is we developed this wonderful course that was basically just buffeted and turned upside down, but is now much better because what happened is we learn. When we going into these communities and breaking new ground, we learn every single time from them as to what, in fact, their thing is, and their, their needs are, and how they should solve them. And the reason that we then start to modify is we, we really, we're it's very genuine. This is not our show, this is their show. And they, if they don't like it, if they don't like what's going on, then in, they inevitably have, have, a, um, have a good reason. But the answer to your question is, how do we come upon a project? It, it's, I, most of these projects are just staring you in the face. I mean, the literacy project was pretty clear. Uh, it had to happen. Uh, the, business, the business one came. Uh, we started with the business course. We started it because prior to my going into government, I had been in business is what I knew. Um, and, uh, but then, and then what really developed it was as soon as Carlana took it over, she began to develop it in an educational base, which I could never have done. So it really is, and you would do the same thing, is you just recognize a need. And one of the great advantages that we have is that we are government, and not a government. I mean, we, we can actually just do something, you know. <laughs> that did not come out right. The, uh... <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Martin, my name is Frank. I work in the business community. So my question is uh, regarding funding for reconciliation. So, Fam family, you said? 
Funding. 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 Okay. So what are the roadblocks that could uh, prevent reconciliation getting an adequate amount of financial resource? And uh, secondly, do you see there's a way that uh, the private and the public sector can work together to find a common solution? Thank you. Well, I, I think that they, I think they have to. Um, you know, uh, just to, to give you how the public and the private sector working together, the, the fact is that the extractive industries, the oil and gas industry and the, the mining industry, in the area, what you'll find in the areas in which they operated, they were quite generous with their funding for things like education and for health care. And in fact, uh, uh, if, if you talk to most, most businesses, if you go to them, they did they in the extractive industries. It took a long time before they realized that they should start to help the local communities. But now, now they're the they they do. But essentially, if you've got a factory here or you've got a business here or or somebody else, most of them today, there's a real there is a labor shortage in Canada. There is a labor shortage in uh, North America. There is a labor shortage in Europe. There is a labor shortage in all of the development economies, economies right now. Um, and it's because what you've got is that you've got this increasing po aging, this aging population imposing a massive uh, 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 demand upon society for better health care and everything else. Um, and uh, at the same time, you haven't got, you haven't got, the, you haven't got the workers to basically provide it. And what we're doing is as, as more and more women enter the workforce, that really was a, that, st that stalled the problem for a while, but it's now getting, it, it, it's come back. And, and so if, business, if we're gonna compete as a country, if we're gonna compete as a country, we have no choice but to fund the education and the training of indigenous Canada. And when business is faced with that, uh, and, and I've had the, the, the conversations, it, the problem isn't that they won't do it, it's they're not aware of it. And it's, the, it's gotta be, it's got, the awareness has gotta be brought to them. Well then what you're gonna find is you'll find business is, go, are going, is going to be contributing. And government, in my opinion, government's gotta essentially make it very clear that there's going to have to be a partnership in, in doing this and, and, and in, in funding the training. I'm, but you know the truth is, I think it's happening. I think, I, I really, I can see it happening right now. But the advantage that will happen of a school like, it, it, what, what, like BD, what we'll bring around, what the Joy Kramer is doing, is as they produce, as they produce indigenous people with the business capacity, you're going to start to see it really increase because the identification from other younger people will say, I can do this. This is, this is not beyond me. And I think what you'll see is it's gonna take a generation, but it, it, we're in a lot better shape from this point of view than an awful lot of other countries. I mean, you think about it, we've got this huge undrawn po population upon which we have not drawn. All we really have to do is to make, give them the opportunity. That's not the case elsewhere. I mean, the, Japan is by far the best example of what I'm talking about. I mean, you've got an aging workforce and they have no young population at all to draw, to draw from. We have time for one more question and I know that we've already identified that person. Back there. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Frank Zampano and um, uh, I was a former educator in Burnaby for 40 years <clears throat> and worked a lot with uh, Indigenous uh, students. My question is, there seemed, in my humble opinion, there seemed to be also a difference in values. Uh, I found that uh, the Aboriginal student really didn't want to shine and didn't want to be in a competitive world. They really wanted to be in a collaborative, cooperative world. And our whole system is quite <coughs> competitive. And I don't know how you change those fundamental values. So I was wondering if you had any comments on that. 
or if I'm just out of touch. Well, my understanding uh, is that that is very, very dependent upon the community. Um, I, I, I know what you're saying, um, the, but that um, I have. Well, I, I'll, I'll simply give you give you an example. The Blackfoot will tell you that they're not. That's not. That does not describe them. I've had that discussion. They will tell you that that does not describe them. Um, and so I think that, but I, I think what you've described a situation that does exist, but I think it varies. Um, it varies depending upon, upon the community. Um, on the other hand, working together is not, is not contrary to a successful, a successful economy. Um, competition is important, uh, but I think that the competition will come. Uh, and I just think, but I think that we have to recognize we have to recognize that there are differences between people. There are differences between between cultures, and that we can we, that we can adjust. That we can adjust, and there are also professions that can live with that. In fact, there are, there are professions where the extreme competitiveness of other people is not would not would not work within those within those professions. So I just think we've got to recognize that people are different, cultural backgrounds are different, and that we can we can start we we can handle it. I. I must say, and, and I'm, I don't, there are people in this room who should really try to answer this question better than I do. I, I've asked, the, I, I don't really believe that, that one of the things that does happen is that in a classroom, I'm told, that the indigenous kids will not speak up as much as the other kids. Um, I don't know if that's cultural, or if it's just the way, if, if, it's, if it's some of the difficulties that, that have occurred. What we have found in our, in, what we have found in our business courses, it has a lot to do with the numbers. It also has a lot to do with that story I told you about Gordon Bell, because what I'm told is that the participation by the kids at Gordon Bell after this exercise was performed was that they, they participated with exactly the same elan as anybody else. Um, you, you raise a you raise a question. There are people here who are teachers who might. Well, you Joy, what you want to respond? So I'll give you an example. Oh, my mic. I'll give you an example right in our MBA program. So you'll have instructors come in and they will comment on the amount of discussion in our in our classes and the amount of sharing of information and our competitive spirit as well and that they wish that they could have that within the other MBA programs that they also teach in. And I think that that's because we feel safe. It's a open environment. We respect each other in that room. We don't feel that anyone is um, presupposing anything on us. And I think that that's part of what happens in classrooms across Canada. It happens in my son's classroom. He talked to the vice principal about it. I mean, it, it happens to this day. And indigenous students, they're not gonna talk about it because they don't believe or feel sometimes, and I'm not making generalizations here, but that it's worth their effort or their energy to, to, to raise that because it's been like that forever. So it's not a good, it's not a positive answer, but I think it's an answer that from a mother and also from the feedback that we've received from instructors from um, coming into the MBA program that they love our classes because we're full of energy and talkative and we have great discussions. So um, I hope that's helpful. We're about to close down, Sorry. so let, yes. me just, let me just say one thing. Um, I, first of all, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for being here for, for, for this. And, and let me just say that in terms of should we be optimistic or not, I certainly am. And one of the reasons I am, take a look at this room. I mean, this room is, this, this room is full. Now look, at, I know that some of you are here because you, you, you really couldn't believe that I could still string a sentence together. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but the fact is that, that, that I think that most of you are here because obviously you really support Beattie. Um, and I think that you really do believe that the issue that we're talking about is fundamental 
to basically our moral, our values center, uh, 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 our values as a country. So I'm really very, I'm very buoyed up by this, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. Pleasure. Okay. <laughs>